All right, guys, um, we're going to get started. Welcome back to our Q&As. Um, thanks to the, you guys that did join us. I'm sure you guys are going to get a lot out of this. So um, if you want to text anybody to jump on, you should have them jump on. We've got Keith Coglin. Is that how I say it, Keith? Yep, yeah, Keith Coglin. Keith Coglin, he's the head coach at uh, St. Thomas University, which is in Miami, correct? Correct. We will get into more of that later. Um, but uh, I thought we'd start. We're going to go through Keith's background, uh, growing up as a swimmer, into his college, what he did post-graduate or post-college, um, how he got into coaching, where he's coached, and then we'll talk about the NAIA experience a couple of weeks ago. You guys, um, we had Amanda Moran on here uh, maybe about a month ago, five, six weeks ago. One of our alumni who swam in Olivet Nazarene had a really good career there uh, after leaving Nebraska after a year. Um, actually was uh, NAIA Swimmer of the Year one year. Um, so this is a nice follow-up for our kids to see what opportunities are available um, in the NAIA, the NAIA realm. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit specifically about St. Thomas and about recruiting. We're going to make sure we touch on the recruiting uh, aspect of things, what you guys can expect, um, especially in the new COVID-19 era um, and transfers and, and, and that kind of stuff. So Keith, we'll get started. Tell us about where you're from originally. Awesome. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, obviously, Brian and, and Coach Todd. Um, <clears throat> known Coach Todd for for probably about ten years now, maybe a little bit more. Um, actually, swam with his his uh, younger brother at Eastern Michigan. So yeah, to kind of start my my background as a swimmer, um, I grew up in Florida. Um, I went to FAU. Uh, as a freshman, Florida Atlantic University, I transferred up to Eastern Michigan. So that that uh, transition from South Florida to Southeastern uh, Michigan in, in January definitely was um, a bit of a change. But I had the, I had the pleasure of, of meeting um, obviously Todd's uh, younger brother, and, and just Eastern Michigan was a great experience. So I think we'll get into a little bit more of that later. Um, How long were you at? I'm going to interrupt. How long were you at FAU? I was I swam for a year um, and then I, I didn't want to continue swimming there. Um, so I basically just went to school, started working a little bit. Um, and halfway through my sophomore year, I decided sure. I wasn't done swimming. What, um, what year was that on, when you were at FAU? I started there 2007, 2008. So it was, was I Neil, went was up Neil, to Eastern, Was Neil Studd uh, still there? He had just left. Neil and I were really friends. Goal. That's why I asked. Gotcha. Gotcha. So okay. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You're at EMU. No problem. Yeah. So uh, transferred to Eastern Michigan. Swam under Peter Lynn um, for my years at Eastern Michigan, where I pretty much that was um, kind of the meat of of my swimming knowledge. Um, he was a overly um, overly brilliant coach. Uh, it's hard to explain exactly the way he coached, but he was. Um, Basically, everything I learned, everything I really took in when you're breaking down swimming when it comes to training, um, race approach, everything that goes into swimming really came from um, from Peter Lynn. That's obviously – I've taken a lot of that into my coaching style. But, um, yeah, I graduated from Eastern Michigan uh, 2012. I did take a fifth year because of I was a transfer. Um, graduated from Eastern Michigan 2012. I immediately began coaching with uh, Club Wolverine. Uh, after I was done swimming, but it was more of just a side job, um, really giving lessons to younger kids. Um, I then coached at Milan Swim Club in Michigan for for a good eight months until I graduated, and I moved back home to Florida. Um, I stopped coaching for a while. I went into insurance, which was okay. It was not for me. Um, there's uh, there's definitely some money you can make in, in that career. You know, if, if you're interested, I would, wouldn't turn away from it. Uh, it just wasn't for me at that time. Then I went into teaching and, and finally found a, a part-time coaching job, um, coaching mostly age group kids, really from eight to 12 years old for probably two or three years. And then was given the opportunity uh, four years ago to move down to West Palm Beach. And, and that's where I really, I truly started my coaching career um, as an assistant at Kaiser University, um, where we started that program up. Um, that's my first full-time job. I was also coaching club at, at a, a smaller club down in here in, in South Florida. Um, and then in March, we finished uh, our fourth season at, at Kaiser University. And I was given the chance to start my own program as the head coach at, at St. Thomas University. And um, 
it's definitely going to be a challenge of starting a brand new program, but it's also very exciting at the same time. You know, unfortunately, nowadays, most of the time, you only hear about swim teams being cut. Um, so when swim teams do start up and, and, and are giving more opportunities, it's, it's a pretty cool experience to be a part of it. Um, so that, you know, without talking too, too much, that's, that's a quick recap of my, my swimming career. Um, and, and, and generally speaking, my young coaching career, which we've had some pretty good success, but, um, you know, now it's a whole new, whole new uh, chapter to the, to the story with uh, St. Thomas University, and I'm looking forward to getting our first year started. That's awesome. So now where, where were you from originally? Where'd you grow up? I'm from the, the Tampa area, Tampa Bay, um, from Clearwater to be exact. Um, I swam at Clearwater Aquatic Team as, as a young kid um, under Mike Yearwood, um, which was a very uh, high volume based uh, program, but um, learned a lot from him, learned a lot of hard work um, in that program. And, and um, that's kind of where swimming really started to get serious for me. Really from the age, I would say from 12 to 13 is where I started to really take swimming um, seriously and started looking at options, uh, hopefully to go further in, in swimming after high school. Nice. Some of our, well, some of these older kids might have been down there for the, uh, in the spring, they run like an age group elite showcase in Clearwater that we used to go to. Uh, we now go to Orlando okay. for the one there, but several of, of us have gone down to that meet. So it's a really cool area. Um, awesome. So talk about your recruiting process and how you ended up at FAU and then ended up transferring. I mean, how, did you enjoy the recruiting process? Yeah, absolutely. I, I did. I did. I, I, um, I luckily had older siblings who went through the process before me. I had um, a older sister and older brother who both went up to Ohio. They went to Wright State University oh. um, and swam under Sean Brin, who's now actually at Indian River down here. Um, so I was fortunate enough to have a lot, of, um, a lot of advice, a lot of points of views to kind of tell me what they went through, what to look for, what they liked, what they didn't like. So um, I, I was looking when I was going through, through swimming. I, I could have been a, a, a small – small fish in a big pond, so to speak. Um, you know, there was a few big D1 power five schools that I, I probably could have walked on to. I was looking to be more part of a, a conference team, um, which not saying if you go to a bigger school, you can't become that. Um, I, I wanted to be a part of a conference team right when I got to a team. Um, so I, I decided to pick kind of a small or a medium fish, medium pond. Um, so I went to FAU really against my – my gut feeling was telling me to go to Eastern. I picked FAU just to stay in state um, for financial reasons and just being close to home and those, those sorts of things, um, which I swam incredible my freshman year, dropped tons of time. Um, I was voted team MVP, most improved, um, made great friends. So I'm still in touch with today. It just wasn't the team atmosphere that I was looking for. Um, you know, when, when I was looking for a college team, I was looking for, that raw, raw team aspect of it. I was looking to get away from the individual aspect of that club swimming can sometimes be very individualized. So I was personally looking for more of that, that team goal of winning a conference title or whatever it is the team's going for that year. Um, so yeah, long story short, after my freshman year, I decided that it just wasn't for me and, and I, I didn't want to go through another year of, of swimming for that particular team. The coach was great. Um, like I said, I swam out of my mind that year. Um, so yeah, then I, then I went through, I guess on the, during the recruiting process, I don't know if there's anything more in depth when you go about that. Um, anything in particular, you know, what I looked for when I was, like I said, um, going through the recruiting process was the team atmosphere, which I missed the first time. Um, and I guess one thing I, I do like to tell a lot of the kids I'm talking to is, I think a lot of swimmers, when they pick a school, they think it's like the end all and be all. Like once they pick a school, that's it. You have to go there no matter what. That's once you pick it, you're, you're there. Um, and yeah, it's not easy to transfer. You have to think of a lot of things, you know, with credits, maybe moving further away from home or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, I, I, I guess I, I, I hope that kids don't put too much pressure on themselves, that initial choice, because you can always, there's other options out there to transfer if that first year doesn't work out exactly how you, how you want. And like I said, for me, I swam great personally. Um, and I just was looking for something different on the team aspect. So yeah, then the, um, the transfer process, to be honest, was, was pretty easy for me. Um, 
I was very open and honest with my coach at FAU. I told him my thoughts immediately. Um, I told him my concerns. So he actually worked with me for a good month about trying to figure out what we could do to keep me at FAU. Um, and I'm thankful that I did that because as soon as we agreed that I wanted to leave, he released me immediately and I was allowed to go wherever I want and start competing immediately. That's nice. Um, Normally you have to sit out a year if they don't give you a release, correct? Right. right. Correct. The rules might be different now. This was back in 2008. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the NCAA rules are with transferring now, but yeah, if, if you can get a release from your current team, it's much, much easier. Uh, I'll put it that way. So, um, you know, I was obviously happy. I handled it that way. A lot of kids, when they do decide to move on, they don't handle it always the, the best way possible, which is a tough decision. So I understand, you know, it's, it's hard to make the right decision every time, but um, yeah, without going into too many details, I guess I, I was released from FAU. I reached out to Coach Lynn at Eastern Michigan because I was the team I had turned down. Mm -hmm. And luckily, he, he wanted me to come in January. And so by, I didn't say October of that year, um, I had signed a smaller, smaller scholarship to go up to Eastern, but I wasn't turning away from it. And um, flew up to uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, or flew up to Detroit in shorts, mind you, in January, <laughs> not thinking twice where I was going to. And um, yeah, I was at Eastern for the next uh, three and a half years or so. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad it worked out really well for you. Seems like it was, uh, a, it was the right choice for you at that time. So was, forgive me for not knowing this. Kaiser, was that NAIA? Yes. Where you were at? So let's talk about the NAIA a little bit. Um, can you give them a little bit of background of you know, what is the NAIA, some advantages, disadvantages, maybe the comp competition level, that kind of thing, and how it's growing? Because they're adding schools in the NAIA, adding teams, I should say, adding swim teams. Absolutely. That's, and it's, it's crazy to think with the NCAA, what's going on with everything, a lot of teams being cut. The NAIA is actually quickly growing. They're actually, we'll be discussing um, making our qual qualifying times for nationals fast this year because we had too many kids in nationals last year. But um, so the way I describe the NAIA and, you know, like what I try to tell everyone I'm talking to, you know, I was a Division One mid-major and celebrated swimmer. So when I was given this opportunity to start coaching at Kaiser and NAIA school, I had a lot of hesitations. I thought it was, if I'm being totally honest, I thought it was going to be kind of a joke. I thought it was going to be the meets not run very well, not very high quality of swimming. I was first thinking of that job as basically a stepping stone. And I was so happy um, – when I went through my first season of, of the high quality of swimming that goes through the NAI, um, I was pleasantly surprised. And so the, I guess to describe the NAI, the way I describe it, what I think of it, it's, it's, it's basically the same as the NCAA. It's just a different governing body and our recruiting rules are much more lenient. Um, we run our championship meets in the exact same format. One of the biggest positives um, that you can, um, that you can get out of the NAI is that we have very, very attainable national cuts. Um, I'm not going to use the word easy, but in my opinion, if you work hard as a swimmer, you can make the national cut. Um, and so what, what a cool thing we built at Kaiser was we were able to build full rosters of kids qualifying for nationals and going to our NAI national meet and winning um, team championships um, on the men's side and our women's side was uh, runner up the last two years. Um, so, you know, I was a decent swimmer, nothing great, but there was no way I was going to make NCAA Division One national cuts. Um, you know, looking back for me, I wish I would have looked into some of these things, Division Two, Division Three, NAI, whatever it is, because I could have gone to nationals for some of those other levels. Um, and again, that's all personal preference. And that's, I think the, the, biggest positive of the NAI it's you know they offer kind of everything NCAA does um, and you can kind of go experience some of these meets that had a very very cool um, and high quality meet now that's you know going to our first national meet again I was not sure what to expect but the atmosphere was incredible I mean some of the times that were being posted I mean the team, uh, SCAD from, from Georgia, they had two boys going 134, two free, um, you know, sub 20, 50 free, um, mm -hmm. 40, 300 freestyle. We had a boy, uh, our second year go 53 in the 100 breaststroke. Um, 
you know, so some pretty high quality swimming. <clears throat> the depth obviously kind of falls off um, from nine to 16 and after that. But um, I guess a lot of people, and including myself, a lot of people overlook just how fast swimming is at the NAI level. Sure. Sure. Are there any disadvantages to the NAIA? Um, I, I don't know if I would, from my experience, most of the schools are pretty small. Um, a lot of them are private schools. So I guess a negative is some of the schools can be a little more expensive. Um, but the team, the schools that are running their athletic programs the right way, they do offer academic and athletic scholarships. Um, so I can't really speak for other schools. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that, that would be a negative is a lot of them are private schools. So you're going to be running into higher tuition and, and that sort of thing. Um, on the swimming side of things, maybe facilities, you know, we, we do have to swim off campus, which, which can be a negative, but I know a lot of division one schools also have to swim off campus. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't think of that. I mean, obviously I'm kind of biased cause I'm an NAI coach, right. um, but you know, there, there's not, there's not too many glaring um, weaknesses. I, I, maybe at nationals this last year, we had too many people. So we're gonna have to speed up the cuts a little bit, but that goes along with, all these school starting programs. Um, a good thing. You know, you're yeah. just going to have more. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I wouldn't say there's too many negatives. I like that. So you talked about, you know, yeah, it does tend to be a number of private schools with tuition, that kind of thing might be a little more expensive, but are most of these teams funded? You, I mean, you hear in the NCAA, oh, our girls team is fully funded, but because of Title IX, the guys team has 4.4 scholarships. Uh, is the NAI mainly fully funded? And is it fully funded? Is it kind of equal between male and female opportunities? So yeah, I, I can't speak for any other schools. The two, the two I, um, I've had experience at, sure. we are considered fully funded, but it's just run in a different way. Um, we're, we're kind of run on, on a discount rate system, um, which I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but um, it's, th there is plenty of scholarships available, especially on the academic side of things. Um, you know, if, if you're doing well in school and you have good test scores, which I know most people aren't even able to take tests right now, um, you can set yourself up with a good chunk of money coming your way on the academic side of things and then use swimming to kind of offset the rest of the the cost. Now, again, that's just the two schools I've been at. I, I really don't know the details of other NAI schools. I'm assuming the ones that are, are competitive that we kind of um, compete against are similar. But again, I, I have no way of, uh, you know, being sure of that. Sure. Sure. So let's talk, take a few minutes to talk a little bit about St. Thomas University specifically where you are. Um, obviously, none of us on here know much about it other than the fact it's in Miami, which we talked about. Um, hmm. So tell us about the, maybe the school, the size of the school, the area, what your facility is like, um, that kind of thing. The nuts and bolts. Absolutely. So um, yeah, obviously St. Thomas is is in, in Miami, Florida. We our our student body is around five thousand, I believe, and that's including uh, grad students and law students. Um, the the law school is is well known. Obviously, that's post grad, but that's that's what, very well known. Um, actually. Uh, Caleb Dressel's uh, lawyer actually is an alum of, of the law school. I actually met with him taking over the job, which was interesting. He was trying to push me to Speedo. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so our, our campus is about 100, 130 acres. Um, it's considered a small school, but it has a large school feel. Uh, most of the kids live on campus. There's uh, four dorm buildings. They're building a fifth. Um, we are just about to finish our brand new College of Business, which is going to be a huge thing for the school. Um, basically, the school went through a rough time, I want to say about five years ago, and they almost merged with Barry University. Um, but luckily, we had a president come in a few years ago, and he's kind of uh, revamped everything. Um, we've had record, record uh, numbers of students, incoming students, the last two years, um, even with this coronavirus, something going on, uh, this year will be our, be our biggest incoming class. You know, we started football last year, starting swimming and wrestling this year, um, starting uh, actually women's flag football, which is actually going to be an NEA sport um, here pretty soon. I'm not sure if anyone's heard about that. Um, so anyway, basically, it, they're just they're just uh, it's growing very quickly. We do not have a pool on campus. Um, we have talked 
about the possibilities of getting that soon, but building a pool takes lots of time. Um, so luckily we, we are going to be using a, a 30 meter by 25 yard pool with a separate diving well. It's about 15 minutes from campus. Um, you know, it's fully, it's actually very, very new, um, plenty of space. Um, so that's, I can send the link to, or some pictures to that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, I hope that information we're on a whereabout. Yeah. 20 minutes from Fort Lauderdale or so. Um, you know, we're kind of right in the middle of a lot of things. I'm not a big uh, South Beach fan. <laughs> uh, I, I try to stay away from Miami and that South Beach area. But um, but no, we're really right in the middle of a lot of things, obviously in South Florida. So um, it's, a, it's a cool area and there are a lot of kids who obviously are, have signed already who are very excited to, uh, to come down and, and start. Uh, I can't beat the weather, that's for sure. How, how Maybe I missed it. How, how big is the university? How many enrolled students? A ballpark? Uh, it's about 5,000 total. Oh, that's not bad at all. Including grad and, and, and law students. Right. So I think this year gotcha. we'll have – I don't know what the undergrad exact numbers will be. I know they've been growing, so I'm not even going to try to say a number. Um, but I do know, like, the, the general number is right around 5,000, I want to say. All right, so let's talk about your program specifically. How many – how many – bodies are you looking for for the men's it's men's and women so how many bodies are you looking for for each team are you trying to build for the first year um i'm hoping to have 20 total 10 men 10 women it's probably gonna be somewhere around 15 and six or seven for year number one um long but down the road when when the program is a little bit more um known and kind of settled in um i would like to have about 22 boys and 22 girls um we're allowed to bring 18, 18 swimmers to nationals. Um, so I think it's necessary to have more than 18 because just with injuries happen, kids don't always make the right decisions. Um, things like that happen. So you definitely want to have more than 18. But I don't want to have, you know, 25 or 30 where I have a, almost a full roster sitting out and not going to nationals. Um, right. So I, I do think that <clears throat> that's one of my selling points of you do have an opportunity to come to this school, go to a national meet, and compete for an NAI national championship. Um, so that's that's what my goal is down the line. Awesome. So when you're out looking for recruits, what are you looking for in student athletes? Well, to start off a program, um, personally, I think it's most important to bring in people who are going to help build the, the correct culture, um, which isn't always easy to do. You're number one, you know, just from my experience at at Kaiser University, um, our second year, our boys tied the national record in the four for relay. We went, I think it was two, two fifty five or two fifty six, which is a pretty pretty solid four free. Um, but we ended up losing, I think, three of the guys in that team just from just from issues. I'll put it that way. I have to go into great detail. <laughs> um, so look, fast swimming is great. Fast swimming is great. But I was probably most stressed. That was the most stress I've ever been probably coaching. Um, and it was just because, like, you never really knew what you were going to get out of the kids. Obviously, you knew they were super talented. Um, but you never knew if they were going to do the right thing on the weekend. You never knew if they were going to class. You never knew if they were doing these little things. So, now that I'm starting a new program, I, it's easy to find people's times. It's easy to talk to coaches and see what their positives and negatives are in the pool. Um, so, what I'm looking for, honestly, is, is someone who's fully bought in, who's ready to work, who's, who's you know – ready to do uh, one thing I always say to my kids is, you know, I don't care if you love each other every single day, but you will respect each other. You know, you're going to work with each other. Um, so that's, I, you know, not to sound like too vague. That's really something that's very important. I think to building a, a brand new team is starting things the right way when it comes to team culture to avoid tons of turnover and kids quitting or getting kicked off and having to recruit more people and almost restarting every single year. Um, so obviously when it comes to swimming, I'm looking for, I'm personally looking for people who have room to improve. Um, you know, I guess you can ask a swimmer what their weaknesses are. And I guess the way I look at it, being a smaller new team is if someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm a 102 breaststroker. And then I ask them what their weaknesses are and they have terrible underwaters or terrible turns. In my mind, it's like, all right, well, we could easily turn that 102 into a 59 or double O right away. You know, if we can just fix those little things. Um, so yeah, on the swimming side of things is I'm looking for someone who's ready to work. Um, great attitude, basically a, 
a team leader. Um, and that's kind of what I'm looking for right now, at least. That's, that's awesome. Um, what are, so and you can compare this to NCAA a little bit if you want. I know your coaching has been, been done at NAIA. What are kind of some common trends you're seeing throughout recruiting? And how have the new rules, like and the NCAA has new rules where they can start a year earlier, basically. I can tell you the club coaches hate it. At least I do. And I think the guys on here would agree with me. Um, it's too early for kids to be doing that kind of thing. Most college coaches aren't a big fan of it. Um, what are you seeing from that standpoint? And how is it affecting you at the NEIA level? Yeah, I also coach club on the side. Um, I think it's ridiculous how early. Um, I do have one boy who's being recruited by some of the biggest schools. And, um, I mean, this kid, great swimmer, but very immature as a, as a young boy. And the fact that he was going through some recruiting questions and, and that sort of thing, I just thought it was way too early. And I think it's almost like he, he almost messed up some of his first um, kind of recruiting um, conversations, which it's good because he's learning it and he's kind of quickly growing up. But, yeah, I, I do agree with it. Just sometimes it's too early. At my level right now, because of, you know, building a, a brand new brand new team, it's a little different, to be honest with you. Um, I am kind of – I'm kind of – especially right now for my first year, I have about four months to build a team. Um, so I'm really looking for – I don't want to say anyone, but I'm looking for someone who wants an opportunity. Um, so with, I guess, answering your question with the NCAA, um, you know, I, I would just – I haven't dealt with it. You know, my advice for the kids is really just try to be as honest as, honest as you possibly can, make as many calls as you can, um, you know, ask a lot of questions, have questions ready, talk to your coaches, talk to your teammates. You know, I always, the way I kind of start my recruiting process is I always have an initial conversation and I always ask the person I'm speaking with to take, you know, five days or so or whatever it is and talk to their family, talk to their coaches, talk to their teammates about our conversation. And generally speaking, the more people you talk to, the more questions they'll, they might bring up or it might be, Oh, that's a good, I should ask that. I didn't think of that. Um, you know, so make sure you make sure you lean on, you know, your support system um, to to answer all the questions that that are important to you. Um, one of the questions I ask my kids is, "What are you looking for most out of your college career?" Or what is what is most important to you out of your college career? And some kids, when I ask them that, they they don't know the answer. They they just they kind of are like, "Well, I, I want to swim," or and then I kind of say, well, how about this? Why don't you think about it? And then we'll get and get back to me and tell me what is most important for you. And there's different answers to that. Some people want a good social life. Some people, school is 100% what they, they're only going to pick their, their college because of education, which really should be closest to that. Um, some people want a certain coach. Some people want a smaller team, a bigger team, whatever the case may be. Um, so, yeah, I guess my advice would be make sure you know what you want before you start going because you know depending on whatever level you're at you're going to have some people calling you and asking you questions and if you're not really sure what you're looking for it might be might make it a little more difficult to potentially make the right decision or the correct decision down the road nice so how has uh, how has COVID-19 affected your recruiting I mean in the NCAA level they just extended the dead period through July now which means coaches can't you know, interact with the athletes and such. How's that affecting you and your recruiting for, especially for a new team? Right. Luckily, the NAIA doesn't really have uh, as strict of rules. <laughs> the Wild West, right? To, uh... Yeah. So, yeah, Wild, Wild West, exactly. Um, so, for me personally, it the biggest thing I think it's affected is international recruiting. Um, so, I do have a handful of internationals that will be coming in, and we don't know – when or if they'll be allowed to even fly into the country um, with the with the domestic kids, um, it hasn't had too much of an effect to be honest with you. I mean, some families I've spoken with, they might have lost a job or been furloughed or something that has definitely had an effect on their decision. Which basically, I've said to the kid, you know, if we need to wait and maybe bring you in January when things maybe are a little more normal, um, that's an option. Um, but I think for me, the, the hardest thing just in the South Florida area and Florida in general, we have so many club teams and we host so many meets and that sort of thing. We just can't, there's no meets. I can't go visit pools. I can't, I can't go watch anyone swim. So that's obviously, I think that's going to have the same effect for anyone. Um, 
but yeah, for me personally, that's been the the biggest effect. Obviously, NCAA they really can't do anything right now, so they they've right. kind of stopped. Right. So yeah. So I'm looking at the group we have here. I don't, and coaches, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't see anybody here who's who's a senior now, just graduated. Um, but we do have some juniors on here, class of 2021 kids um, that haven't signed yet or committed anywhere. Um, what can they be doing? Um, how does this you know, pause in recruiting affect them, um, that kind of thing. What would your advice to them be at this point, hoping to be getting into a college, you know, 15, 14, 15 months from now? All right. Um, first thing I would say, your grades. Make sure your grades are staying where they are, if not getting better. I mean, a lot of people, they could argue now, you have nothing else going on because you're stuck at home. You know, your grades really should be. I know down here we're, we're finishing school pretty, really soon, I'm not sure or when you guys are, are finished or done. But I think it's kind of a fair – it's kind of a fair thing to say is, well, you can't really go out. You can't do anything. So if your grades are going down now, that's that's not good. Um, so make sure you stay on top of your grades. Um, being – taking part of these little things um, is, is a very, very good step. Um, obviously, your coaches know who's on here. Um, and then really trying to like think outside the box. I'm not sure if you, uh, I think Todd said you, know, you guys have been doing some dry lands um, or trying to here and there as much as possible. So, you know, making sure you're just taking part in anything the team has to offer. And then at the same time, you know, like I said, thinking outside the box, doing anything you can within your own environment, um, you know, stay in shape, um, stay kind of up to date with, with what's going on and with college teams and, and, you know, and, and this would be a perfect time to really sit down and really start to think of recruiting questions and, um, as I said before, like what you're looking for in a college. Um, so when the recruiting process does start up again, you know, you're not, you're not caught off guard or, or you're not really ready for it. Um, so that would be my advice. Obviously, we're all kind of handcuffed and not really, you know, I know my club team is able to get back in the pool the last two weeks. Um, so we're starting to slowly get back into it. But, you know, until that time happens, that's my advice would just do what your coaches ask. and. So I guarantee whoever is recruiting you or wherever you're looking, they're going to reach out to your coaches, whether you like it or not. And I'm pretty sure your coaches will not, will not, um, they'll be pretty honest with, the, with uh, whoever they're speaking with. So, you know, the more you do, the more um, you take part of whatever they, they put together for you, the better. Excellent. So now we also have some younger kids in here, class of 2022, 2023. What should their timeline be look like? When should they start reaching out to college coach? I mean, we never encourage anyone to just sit around and wait to be contacted. Um, you know, we want them to be proactive. So what should that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure. In my opinion, I would say, you know, the beginning, the beginning of your junior year in my opinion. Um, with NCAA now, they probably, a lot of those coaches will probably say they want it sophomore year. Um, I think it depends on the level you're looking at. I think it depends on the level of swimmer you are. Um, I, I just think it depends on the, what schools you're interested in. I think there's a lot of things that, that go into that. Um, I definitely think by at least middle of your junior year at the latest, you should be sending messages out, letters out, contacting coaches. Um, so that, that's the kind of timeline. Again, I, get, I think there's too many variables to give you give an exact. So, you know, I would say at least by the beginning or middle of your junior year should be actively uh, getting your information out to coaches. I think that's helpful for these guys so they know what their timeline needs to look like. Um, keeping the grades up being important. Um, NAIA question. Are transfers allowed in the NAIA? Is there a sitting out period? Is it comparable to NCAA? Yeah, it's basically the same. Basically the same. Um, you just have to make sure credits are a big thing when you transfer, but it's the same as NCAA. Um, if your credits aren't up to a – whenever whenever you decide to transfer. Actually, for example, I have a, a boy I'm talking to, and this story is pretty crazy. He is a Spanish boy. He went to Limestone College as a freshman, and they cut the program after his freshman year. And then he transferred to Tiffin as a sophomore, and they cut Tiffin. So now he's, now he's talking to me to try to come in as a junior. Um, so I'm trying to go through his, his grades. I believe he'll be a little bit behind in credits. So if he signs, I have to try to get him signed up for some summer classes to get caught up in, in um, credits. So basically the way NAIA works is like 24 credits each year. You have to make sure 
year, finishing at least 24 credits per year. But I'm not sure exactly what the NCAA is. Um, the NAI is definitely more lenient with, as usual, with, with right. transfers and that sort of thing. But it's more about – well, the NAI has their, their rules with, transfer, with credits, but also each institution is going to have their certain rules when it comes to kids transferring in or out. Sure. What, what is your feeling on recruiting services? There's berecruited.com, collegeswimming.com, um, the National Collegiate Scouting Association, where some of them have like free platforms, but to get, you know, you can buy or buy into their higher level platforms. What, what is, do you use those? Or what's your thought process on those? Um, I do use those just because I'm so new. No one knows who I am. And a lot of people won't even, if I send an email, they'll probably just put it in the trash and, and move on. Um, so being so new and trying to build a swim team so quickly, yes, I have been using them. Um, as my team grows, I'll use them less and less and use more of a coach's connection kind of thing and, and call coaches directly. And um, my opinion on them, as, as a swimmer and athlete, it, I, I don't know. I, I, you guys, obviously, are, it's a well-known club. I think if you, you – know, the first person I would go to is my coach. Um, you know, and, and – I guess if, if you're not getting the exact results you're looking for, you know, also it needs to be, you need to take some of that responsibility on your, on yourself as, as an athlete. Um, so that, that, that would be the first routes I would go as coach, make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and then if you decide to pick one, you know, I would make sure you're, you're doing your research and picking the, the right ones. Cause some of them, um, some of them aren't so great. Um, so I'm not going to go into like any names, but I would just make sure you're, you're doing your research. If you decide to use one of them, that you're, you're not just finding the first one or the cheapest one and saying, Oh, this is good enough. I'm just going to use this one. Um, so yeah, that's my opinion on those. Um, I think I've kind of gone through this with the first, my two schools, cause they're both brand new programs. So we were basically looking any way to get our name out there. Um, so yeah, I would contact some of the owners of these, these smaller companies and just say, Hey, St. Thomas is starting a program. Do you have any kids, you know, that are still looking for schools that are interested in, um, you know, in talking to me? So, um, so yeah. Sure. Excellent. I'm going to steal a, a question from Coach Ken Ross when you did one with, with their team a couple weeks ago. Uh, and after this, guys, we're going to go into some Q&A. You guys can ask, ask some questions. So hopefully you guys will come on screen and we can see your faces. Um, but I, I've actually long wondered this this question. You know, you'll, you'll see kids go to college, and some kids will just swim way faster, and some kids will never get never swim as fast as they did during their club or high school years. Um, what separates athletes who excel in college versus the ones who don't? It's a good question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, their activities outside of the pool. Um, whether that's on the weekends, not making the right decisions for you. You know, it's the first time on your own. It's the first time when you're really taking a lot of responsibility on your own shoulders. And that just literally comes to just eating the right thing on a daily basis. Um, I think one of the things that is some kids have a difficult time doing is if you swam great all through high school, you're, you, I think it's human nature to have a certain – Did I freeze? Questioning, even if you're not, you know, if in your mind, you're questioning what the coach is doing. If you're, if you're kind of going into practice with a very pessimistic mindset um, and you're always thinking, well, in, in high school or in a club swimming, we did this. Oh, well, back then we did this. Well, you know, why are we doing it this way? I think that's one of the biggest, um, that's one of the biggest kind of, um, hurdles that someone can get over. Um, in my opinion, and this is something I told, told my old, old team. Um, if you come in, I, I told my kids once they come in, if you come in and do everything I ask and you put in the best effort and you don't get faster, it's my fault. And I'd be happy to sit down with that student athlete after the year and, and really kind of break down the season th and see what I could do differently. Um, our track record um, with my last team, pretty much everyone who bought in and did what we asked, um, they swam fast. Some swam faster than others, but they all got faster. Um, so, you know, that's, that's probably one of the 
the biggest things that kind of, in my opinion, that will hold someone back is going in and living in the past almost and not buying into new things, which not all things are, are best for you. And not all, you know, not everything every coach does is perfect, but you know, my advice is if you do everything the coach asks and you don't get faster, a, I think the coach should be willing to have that conversation with you at the end of the season and see what you can do differently the next year. Um, but yeah, my, my advice, and that's, that, I think almost that ties back into the recruiting aspect is when you're going through your recruiting process, really do, do your work and try to find the right atmosphere and coach that you want to swim in. Because if you, if you kind of pick a school based on maybe some other, maybe social life or maybe just, you know, maybe your parents went to a certain school and you're going to go there just because you might go there and start swimming and hate it. And it's going to be really difficult to swim faster if, if you don't enjoy um, swimming on a daily basis. So, you know, make sure you're doing your homework on your recruiting side of things. Make sure you're, you're, you know, you're looking for the right coach and, and the right program or in the, and whatever you're looking for in the team atmosphere, that sort of thing. And then when you get there, do your best to buy in and do everything you possibly can on your end to swim faster. And like I said, if, if you don't, then it's fair to sit down and have a conversation with the coach and, and adjust accordingly. Fair enough. I like that. All right, guys, let's see some faces on here. Who's got, who's got some questions for Coach Keith? Somebody has to have questions. Come on, everybody, come on screen. Who's got questions? Drew? Okay, Drew, go ahead. Unmute. So when a swimmer is reaching out to you, like contacting you, like what are some things you want to see and like hear from them to like, like start the conversation, like what's going to pique your interest? Good question. Good question. I mean, most kids, they'll, they'll send their times, um, which I think times will help, but it's not very difficult to find people's times nowadays. Um, so I would, I would include your, your background of, of swimming, where you where you swim, who your coaches are, um, maybe why you're interested in, in reaching out to that school. Those would be a few simple things. And I don't think it needs to be a super long email. It doesn't need to be, you know, to be honest with you, if I'm going through 50 emails, um, if, the, if the last one is a super long email, it might take me a little while to get through it. Um, but, yeah, so I, those are a few, a few good things. I would say where you swam, who you swam for, and, and why, you know, why you're interested in that school. And yeah, I think those are a few, a few good starting points, you know, maybe including um, – I think it's almost good sometimes to not include your times – um, I mean, I guess I'm on the fence about that because some coaches might say, well, I don't know your time, so I'm not going to talk to you. So I guess that would be a personal preference because I, I like to think, you know, if a coach actually takes the time to read through their emails, they'll do their own little research and they can find your times like that. Um, so maybe just, you know, including maybe your best events or your best strokes or something like that and including your times or not. I don't, I don't, personally, I don't think that it's that big a deal on the times part. Good question. That's a Thank good question. you. That's a very good question. Who else? Lauren, anything? You've always got good questions. Okay, Shauna. She just likes to talk. True. Shauna, you're up. Jenna, you had one. Did Drew ask the same thing? Uh, I was going to ask, in contrast to what Drew asked, what are things you don't want to see in an email or a text? Ooh. Oh, I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some bad ones. <laughs> That's an interesting um, question. That is an interesting question. Um, really, I, I've just gotten emails. The ones that I personally don't like are the, the ones that are not thought out whatsoever. Like, I want to know more about your program. And then sometimes not even like a name or just like their first name. Um, So obviously, it takes some time. There's like simple. I if if someone makes one mistake, I'm not gonna, you know, be too harsh on them about that. But obviously, if if there's like no periods and you know if it's totally grammatically wrong, that might be a little uh, 
alarm. But um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. So that's that's kind of the main thing. I, I just think if if you have a well written email, it's not too personally. I also don't like when the emails are super super long um, with their full backstory. Where obviously it's nice to read the information, but I like to get the information on my phone calls or when I talk to them in person. Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. I hope that helped a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? He must have done such well, a good job of covering everything. Glenn, go ahead. I, I don't. I'm just. I'm nagging Ben Robertson right now. That's all. Sure, uh, I'll ask a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 All right. Uh. So, is the transition between high school and club swimming to college swimming, do you see as a coach uh, that swimmers struggle with that transition or do they, is it smooth for them? Um, I, I've seen, I've seen both. Um, I, I guess not to be repetitive, but that, that's why the, the recruiting process on your end is that important to make sure you're doing kind of your homework to make sure you're setting yourself up to be as successful as possible. Um, I've seen lots of success stories and, and that's the, the success stories are when, when you go in somewhere with kind of an open mind, you do what you're, you're supposed to, you stay focused. Um, it's, you know, it is, it is a big transition. You're out on your own for the first time. Um, you know, a lot of the responsibilities you have are going to fall directly on your shoulders and you're not going to always have someone, um, you know, kind of holding your hand, so to speak, and, and helping you through every step of the way. Um, but I've also seen through my few years, I've seen some people come in and struggle right away. And it's for different reasons. Some people get homesick. Some people just didn't like the way we were coaching them. Um, some people just couldn't handle the freedom and weren't going to class or whatever it might be. Um, so yes, the, the transition can be difficult, but I think if you're picking the right, the right place and the right coach and the right program, um, if the coach is doing their job, they, they're, a big part of their job is to help the athletes get through those, those tough times to make sure they, you know, I, I don't think it's possible for anyone to go through a full four year college career and it go perfectly smooth the entire time. Um, but that initial transition, that's a big part of the coach's job is to help to help the freshman coming in with that transition. And again, just tying it back to the recruiting <coughs> process, that's why it's so important to, to do your homework and make sure you're picking the right place for you and, and your family. Okay, thank you. Good answer. These are good questions. More questions? Um, I have right, a question. Go ahead. Um, in the NAIA, what's the balance like between school and athletics? Uh, so that depends entirely on the institution. Um, I run my program just like an NCAA program. We have we have nine practices a week, uh, three weight sessions. Um, you're expected to be at every practice. Um, with the smaller schools, you will have some class conflicts, or you, I'm sure other schools have class conflicts as well. Um, there are probably more because of a lot of the schools are small private schools. Once you get into kind of your sophomore, junior year, the options of whatever classes you're going to take are much more limited. So there will be some more um, times you have to miss practice in the afternoon or whatever it might be. Um, so obviously you skip practice and you go to class, but you know, when I say it depends on the institution, I'm not sure exactly how other NAIA schools do it. I do know the top ones, um, I'd say the top four or five female and male programs are running theirs very similarly to a NCAA division one, division two program. Um, so yeah, I mean, at our last school, which I'm working on here, you know, we had, we had a massage therapist come to nationals with us. You know, we had an extra weight coach. We had basically a staff of four or five, obviously the two main coaches and an extended staff. Um, so yeah, that we try to run as, as closely as we possibly can to a, a fully funded, um, you know, proper NCAA program. Nice. Other Thank questions? You. Aiden, you got a question? You always have a question. Nothing. All right. I don't have a question necessarily, but since nobody's asking questions, I'm going to hijack this for a second. Keith, 
You, uh, Lake, dog. Lake Lytle, you apparently uh, coach my, my nephew and, uh, and niece, Zach and oh, Abby, oh, and you know my brother. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my dog. Just found that out during this call. So. I, was watching, I saw your name and I'm like, huh, yeah, at Lake yeah. Lytle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I've probably seen you. I, I go down there like once a year and they end up dragging me to the pool deck and I'm watching them, so. <laughs> Yeah. Very cool. Small world. Yeah. Swim yeah. world, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Gotta love that. So at FAU, was Steve still the coach when you were there? Yeah, Steve was. He kind of yeah, checked he, out the last few years. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I mean, he, he still knew what he was doing. Like I said, I, I yeah. Yeah, an example of, I guess when I say like you got to buy in, um, did I love every bit of swimming under Steve? No. Like I thought, I guess I agree he was checked out. But I bought in and I trained my butt off and I, I dropped significant time. I wouldn't have been able to go to Eastern if I didn't, right. um, or at least get money to Eastern if I didn't do it in my freshman year. So I think that's, uh, that's a prime example of you may not love everything about the coach. You may not love everything about the program. But if generally speaking, if you buy in and work, work your butt off, I think it's hard not to get faster. Um, you may not get as fast as you want. You may not hit every goal time you want to get to, but – I think if, if you go in with the right attitude and, and you do everything you possibly can, um, you, I, I do think you will get faster. And, and I think that I think the big thing for these kids is to realize it, the difference is you don't have mom or dad driving you to practice or making sure you're getting to practice and getting home. You don't have mom and dad making your meals. You don't have mom and dad at your homework done. This is all on your own. Like you have right. to take ownership of your goals and your swimming journey, like mm -hmm. more, more and more. And that's what's going to define your success in college. Yep. Yeah, that's – and obviously, you know, you're going to have support staff around you. You're going to have right. you know, tutors to go see and that sort of thing. But, yeah, you know, it's up to you to wake up for practice. It's up to you to – you know, if you – I was walking for at Eastern Michigan. I'd walk at 5.30 in the morning. It was 10 degrees outside. You walk to practice. Obviously, you know, no one enjoys doing that, but you have to make sure <laughs> – you have to make sure you're getting practice. Otherwise, it's like, you know, you lose your spot or um, – you know, I was fighting for a conference spot at Eastern and – you know, there was one day I woke up, I remember it was 5.50 in the morning. I jumped out of bed because I was late, threw on a pair of shorts, a sweatshirt, and shoes. I ran through the snow to get to practice on time. And I got there, and Coach Lynn was like, why are you breathing so heavy? I told him, and he was kind of like, hey, it's okay for a few minutes late. But I was like, I was just on the team. I don't want to, you know, throw off my chances of being on that, on that conference team. So, yeah, I, I, it just – a lot of it falls on your shoulders. Most places have a lot of support. But at the end of the day, it, it really it's, – it's up to you – what you want to make out of your college experience. Um, obviously, you can make a good decision of picking the right school and coach, but, you know, I, I think no matter where you go, it's not going to be, it's not going to be perfect the entire way through. Um, so that's where, you know, you need to adjust as well and communicate with the coaches and then do all those little things correctly to, uh, to set yourself up to be successful. All right. Hey, if, any more questions, guys? Jenna, go ahead. Jenna. Um, so I just finished my sophomore year of high school. When should I start reaching out to coaches? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see why, like, this summer. The summer could be a good start. Um, maybe after – I would say it, it, maybe this summer or into your junior year. Maybe if, if you don't reach out this summer just because, you know, I know, like, our long course season down here is already canceled. Um, so we're training, but there's no meets. Um, you know, depending on what schools you're looking at, if NCAA is still in that, that um, lockout period or whatever they're calling it, you know, it might be good to wait till after that. But maybe, you know, maybe not on the NCAA level. They might be waiting to get emails so that when they can start responding, they'll have them waiting. So, yeah, you know, I don't think it's bad to start too early. Um, yeah, I, just, I would just – my recommendation is make sure, you know, you're, you're kind of taking your time and not getting too caught up too quickly in it and trying to make a decision too quick. I, I don't see the problem um, with, with taking your time and starting the, the communicating process is not a bad thing, but you know, just making sure that you are taking your time. You're, you're looking at all different sorts of, of opportunities. Um, that's one of my, my main frustrations when I talk to my club kids, so many of them are locked in, they have blinders on and they want to go one, two or three places. That's it. And they, they might talk to other schools, they might get emails or whatever it is, but deep down they're not really listening. They're still locked in. My advice for all of you is keep an open mind. You never know exactly the perfect fit. 
for you. Um, you never know. You just never know. My, my, my sister, for example, she was heavily recruited by Yale. She was a brilliant student, heavily recruited by Yale. I'll never forget as a kid, she's like six years old than I am. I'll never forget as a kid, my mom answered the phone one day, and this was before smartphones. And my mom turned down Yale, and my sister went to Wright State University, which probably most of you have not heard of. And so my mom was like, this is crazy, just turned down Yale. My sister, the reason why she picked the team is because it was a smaller team. She wanted to be one of the better swimmers, but she also wanted to finish her master's within four years. And so she set up by the time, so she had everything paid for. She had a full scholarship, undergrad paid for, and master's all done. And she was ready to start working right, right away. And now she is very, very successful. And so that, that's something, you know, I took to heart when I was looking at school. I was like, man, Julie had all this opportunity to go to Yale and, and Ivy League and all this, you know, how great that would be. And she totally went against the grain and still just was, had a great experience and set herself up to have a, a, a very, very nice life for herself. So that's um, my main advice. Yeah. So timeline, start reaching out now if, if you want to. I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing to do. But I'll make sure you guys are all keeping kind of your, your, your – have an open mind and, and, and look at all different avenues of, of where you could potentially end up. Thank you. Excellent. Any more, guys, before we wrap up? Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, how, is, how important is, is it for you to see, uh, like, a well-rounded swimmer? Um, so, like, involved in, like, extracurriculars and other stuff? Yeah, great question. Um, when you first said well-rounded swimmer, I was thought you were just referring to swimming. Um, so I'll address that afterwards. That, that is a, that is a big one. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's it's important because it shows that that individual can handle more than just swimming in school. Um, if they're able to, you know, get great grades in school, swim very well, and then do all these other things on the side and, and be whatever it might be, NHS. I'm not sure what the in high school nowadays, what the different um, clubs and sort of things are. Um, multi-sport athletes. Um, you know, I was a multi, multi-sport athlete when I was going out of high school. I like to look at those things. I think someone who's athletic, who has proven they can do different things, I think generally speaking that they might have a little more upside in the pool. Um, but yeah, so I, to me personally, if, you, if someone has all these different extracurricular activities, it just shows to me they, they're very good already about – handling a lot on their plate um but yeah then when it just tied back to the swimming part of it yeah if you're a well-rounded swimmer that's what every coach is looking for to be able to have someone that can go in every different direction um, whenever the team might need them mm -hmm. all right thank you good questions everybody these are these are much better than sandpipers no <laughs> sandpipers i'm gonna let ken ross know that too <laughs> <laughs> who else any other questions from anybody all right, well, Keith, thank you for taking the time to spend with us. I really appreciate this. We're also going to uh, take this recording and put it on our YouTube channel for our members cool. to see. Um, I think it's great. Awesome. Put, put St. Thomas on the map. I have no doubt that they're going to be successful, and I, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to encourage any of our boats to to check out your school. Absolutely. Yes. Many kids that would that would be probably perfect for for your, your situation. Yeah, and I, I sent out, I'm not sure if, if you guys sent out that the spreadsheet of times from the NAI last year, um, I sent them to Todd. Okay. It's basically, uh, it's a spreadsheet that just highlights what the qualifying times are, what 16th place was last year, eighth and first place. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the level is at at the NAI. Um, sure. So if you guys yeah. want that, just reach out to Coach Todd, send him an email. He has it. Um, uh, yeah, and we'll if make does, sure I'll you get it. Send it to him again. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Obviously, I'm allowed to talk to anyone right now. Um, obviously, if you're interested, great. If you just have some more questions that that kind of pop in your head and you're like, hey, coach, I was just thinking about this, um, feel free to uh, to reach out. I'll be happy to help. Awesome. Well, thanks, Very Keith. Cool. We appreciate your time. Uh, I learned a lot. So uh, this was great. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, thanks to you guys who tuned in, and we appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Kate. Thank that was you. awesome.